morning, everyone. Good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are tuning in from. Our speaker today, Professor Max Velling, I think is joining from Amsterdam, so evening over there. Alexandra and I are speaking to you from Mila in Montreal. So yeah, feel free to say hi in the chat and write your location if you want. My name is Alex, and it is a great, great pleasure to welcome all of you to the fifth talk, I think, of our AI Helps Ukraine conference. We are really looking forward to listening to Professor Velling about machine learning and molecular generation. But before that, and while a few more people trickle in, we would like to take a couple of minutes, as always, to, to briefly introduce the, the charity conference, AI Helps Ukraine. Hello, Sasha. <laughs> Hello, Alex. Thank you. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Uh, and uh, uh, as a part of the organizing team, I would like to take you a bit to tell you a bit more about uh, our conference. Uh, let me just quickly share my slides. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Uh, so uh, our conference uh, is is a charity. It's a charity conference. AI helps Ukraine, where we bring together uh, leading AI experts to. Uh, to present uh, recent advances of their research and in the same time we are raising funds uh, for Ukraine to support uh, people in Ukraine with humanitarian aid. Uh, our conference uh, takes place both online and offline. Uh, we have online talks uh, start, which started at October and will last until late December and uh, we also have an in-person event on the 8th of December at Mila in Montreal. You are very welcome to register at all our events on our website for the online talks uh, and for the in-person event we will send you uh, a link once the registration will be open. And uh, I want to remind you that registration to all our events is free because we believe that not should be accessible to everyone. But at the same time, we uh, we kindly ask you to support our mission. Uh, and uh, we insistently asking you for donations because unfortunately uh, the uh, war in Ukraine is uh, still ongoing. And uh, right now, uh, many people in Ukraine. Um, they live in the destroyed areas. Alexandra, sorry, yes. hold on a second. Uh, there are some people who are not hearing. Uh, can you, could, if, if participants can hear what we are saying, uh, can you write it in the chat? This is a bit confusing. So people, okay. Okay. Right. No, well, uh, Alexander and I are sharing the, the microphone. So yeah, because we are in if, the same she room. Appears, uh, yeah, we're together here. <laughs> <laughs> OK, it seems like it's fine for most people. OK, OK. okay Thank, no. you, Thank you, Joshua. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry for the interruption. So, no worries. Uh, yes, yeah, so uh, we are asking you to donate because uh, war is, is still ongoing. Many people are suffering and they really need help, even basic things like food, warm sh shelters, especially now when the winter is coming. And uh, just to give you a sense of what, uh, what we're going to buy on your donations, for example, uh, this uh, device, um, portable negative pressure wound therapy, is uh, uh, very, very important for treating um, injuries which people can get from missiles. And unfortunately, it's very expensive, and that's why very few Ukrainian hospitals can afford it. And um, we are aimed at buying it as much as we can uh, to help uh, to help treat people because this is a game changer in in this treatment. Uh, but uh, even small contribution is very important. Important. Uh, our partner Ukraine Medical Support uh, they are producing these uh, food boxes which you uh, see on the slide, and uh, they distribute it across the areas uh, where people really really need it. Uh, and one box costs just twenty bucks, uh, and it not big for people who live, uh, for example, in Canada, but for people there, it makes a huge difference because one box can uh, provide food for a family of four people for a couple of days. So uh, any contribution is very important. Uh, please support us according to your possibilities. And uh, thanks, thanks to everyone who already supported us, uh, and many thanks to our partners, uh, Miller Quebec Institute, who kindly supports us with venue and logistics, and also to our partner Ukraine Medical Support, uh, who processes uh, all all your donations uh, and uh, helps us to buy uh, and deliver uh, supplies to Ukraine. 
And uh, also many thanks to our uh, first sponsor, uh, Google Montreal. And uh, at this point, I give stage to Alex to introduce our today's speaker. Yeah, thank you, Alexandra. Yeah, indeed, we are about to get started. Let me first quickly mention a few important house rules and practicalities, as always. So everybody, welcome to, to use the Crowdcast chat during the, the presentation for discussion, comments, uh, sharing relevant papers, etc. Uh, you can also use the Q&A feature on the on the right to ask your questions to, to Max Welling and we will we will have the questions after the talk, uh, the discussion time. And you can also, even if you don't have a question, you can go to the to the Q&A feature and upvote the questions of, of others. Um, and finally, the organizing team strives to make this virtual conference an inclusive and safe space for everyone. So we can kindly ask all of you to help us with this. We have a code of conduct. It's available on our website and according to according to it, and to keep things nice for everybody, any hate speech or harmful comments will not be tolerated. Okay, uh, I think now we are ready to introduce Professor Max Welling, even though he surely needs no introduction for anyone in the machine learning community. Welling is a professor at the University of Amsterdam, where he directs the Amsterdam Machine Learning Lab. That is already quite something, but the list is actually longer, just to mention a few things. Uh, Max is a fellow of both. TIFAR and ELLIS, so two of the major research institutions on each side of the, of the Atlantic Ocean. And he's a distinguished scientist at Microsoft Research and has a lot of other solid experience in, in research and industry. Uh, Max Belling is best known for his notable contributions to key aspects of machine learning research, such as variational Bayesian inference, graph neural networks, generative models, invariant and equivariant models, and among many, many other things. For me and for Alexandra too, I think, for example, who research applications of AI for accelerating scientific discoveries, Max Welling's work is part of the, the basic research kit. And I'm truly excited to listen to, to the talk today about generating and steering molecules with machine learning and reinforcement learning. So Professor, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. And uh, I first want to congratulate uh, the organizing team for doing this. Of course, it's a really wonderful initiative and I've promised to uh, to donate. I uh, I saw there is actually a leaderboard on the donations and uh, so I saw the the highest uh, is pretty high. So uh, so let's see who's going to win. Uh, fantastic. Um, and um, yeah, very happy to do this, of course. Actually, this is the second time I see something like this coming out of Mila. So it's really Mila is becoming a leader in these kinds of social um, uh, sort of uh, AI for social good, and I, I really, I really think that's a great example we should all follow. Um, okay, so let me try to uh, now share my screen. Um, yeah, sorry, it's a bit bigger. Um, okay, so if um, if you uh, if you can't see anything, I have trouble. Uh, please uh, notify me, and I'll uh, I'll try to change things. Um, yeah, so um, I'm at the University of Amsterdam, but also um, sort of four days a week I now actually spend at Microsoft Research. There is a lab in Amsterdam that we started about a year ago um, precisely on applying AI uh, to scientific discovery. Um, and that's what I want to talk about today. I, I had to think a little bit about what I talked about last time uh, when I was talking at Mina, so I don't want to have too much overlap. Um, and so um, what I'm going to talk about um, is after a very brief production, talk about PDEs for the first half of the talk and how deep learning can actually, well, maybe revolutionize the field of PDEs. Um, then I'll talk about molecular generation and control as promised and with two examples of some recent work, um, and then I'll uh, conclude. So um, science is really a super fascinating field. Um, so uh, it, it spans like many, many orders of magnitude, both in spatial and temporal scales, um, all the way down from particle physics, uh, you know, at picometers and femtoseconds, um, all the way up to astrophysics, where, you know, we talk about light years and giga years. And in the middle, there is molecules, um, you know, plasmas, fluids, you know, you know, earth and geophysics, and so many more orders of magnitude. But what, what is interesting to me is that many of these domains are described by one tool. And the tool is called um, 
either ordinary or partial differential equations, which are sort of cousins of each other across all of these scales, right? So you could go to the Schrodinger equation, which is just a PDE, and you go all the way up to you know fluid mechanics or you know or general relativity, which spans like massive scales, which is also a PDE. Um, interestingly, in machine learning, we don't give much attention to PDEs, and so uh, maybe uh, that should change. Now, AI has already been making um, a big impact um, on the sciences, and when I say AI, personally, I mean deep learning, but I'm sure there's other fields in AI that have also contributed to that. And here's a few examples um, that we all probably know quite well because they have appeared in the media. Um, there's the uh, prediction of the three-dimensional structure of a protein from the amino acid sequence, fantastic work by DeepMind. Um, EPFL, in collaboration with DeepMind, also um, a great work on um, using reinforcement learning to keep plasma stable inside a tokamak fusion reactor. Um, and here I just sampled from my own paper, but there are many, many papers in this field now, and it's an exploding field, which is trying to model molecules uh, with uh, machine learning, both generating molecules out of thin air, as well as analyzing molecules uh, for their properties. Um, so now for most of you in the audience, I hope uh, this is uh, sort of superfluous. Um, I just wanna say a few words about the tools um, at a quite high level, we're not going to go into too many details in this talk. Um, so it's a convolutional neural network. Convolutional neural network takes an input image or two-dimensional, one-dimensional signal and, and scans it uh, with a filter, like in a convolution. Um, it does this with many filters, so you get a feature stack, uh, then typically a nonlinearity, and then some pooling uh, to reduce the, the space. Um, and then you repeat, rinse and repeat until the last layer, and then you apply a typical uh, flat uh, sort of uh, classification algorithm to it. And you back propagate through the stack uh, to adapt the filters. So um, I started to think about graph neural networks with my students, in particular, Thomas Kipp was the first one to, to work on this um, by really rethinking a, um, a convolutional neural network as a graph neural network. So you can think of that as an algorithm which sends messages from neighboring pixels uh, to the central pixel. It's basically, it's a, it's a feature vector here, which you can think of as the values of the pixels of this left upper corner, the sort of the hidden variables here. Um, so that's a vector here that gets multiplied by a matrix. Everybody uses a different matrix um, and you send a message to yourself, you put it through nonlinearity and you iterate. Now, this, this process is easily generalized to an irregular graph. So if the number of neighbors is, first of all, the ordering is undetermined, and secondly of all, uh, the number could vary, um, then one very easy trick to resolve this issue of having different uh, neighbors that are fixed in their ordering, but just using the same matrix here. This is exactly what Thomas Kipp did, um, and which you know, turned into this uh, convolutional graph neural networks. Now this field has evolved and there has been a huge number of new architectures applied to all sorts of things. Um, so the ones that I'm interested in and, and will use for, for typically for the molecular work is one that is um, equivariant. So this basically means that the neural network doesn't get confused if you rotate the universe around it, right? If you change the coordinates by rotating and translating um, the objects, the, the, the neural network of the space, Neural network doesn't confuse it, understand that it's just a rotation. We'll just give you exactly the same predictions. Now, here a little bit more detail. Um, or I said there wouldn't be no equations, but here I guess there's one equation. <clears throat> so this is a graph neural network. So there's nodes. In these nodes, there are properties. There's a bunch of scalar properties, each and a bunch of vector properties, V. Um, this is a work by the authors like uh, Victor and Emil um, in, uh, in, in my lab. Um, it's a very simple architecture that's, that's nevertheless nice and varied and contains vectors. The, the scalars, um, they, they get updated uh, through some nonlinear function. That's a message. Um, and then there is a, the, yeah, and here's the definition of the message can depend on the activations on the left and the right. And on the distance, all of these are scalars. Don't transform on the translations and rotations. So then you accumulate all the messages. Um, and then there's also an update on the vector quantities x and it's linear in x so that means that if it's linear that will still 
a vector turns into a vector, but it's it's multiplied by a nonlinear sort of pre prefactor. And so this is still surprisingly powerful. Um, and then the whole thing is equivariant, which basically means if you rot first rotate the graph and then process it, like in a layer, or first process it and then rotate, you'll get the same answer. So again, so now we are, we'll switch into a partial differential equations. Um, now, of course, partial differential equations are used for many, many things, as I already alluded to. Um, one of the major ones, for instance, is predicting the weather, right? It's, it's hugely important that we know the weather tomorrow in a week or in a week or two weeks time, um, but also for climate prediction, right? So what is going to be the temperature on this planet at the end of the century? We really don't know. It's between 1.5 and 5 um, somewhere. Um, and, and the uncertainty is not coming from us not knowing how much carbon we emit, but basically from not us being able to integrate the forward, the uh, the the partial differential equation. So it's hugely important, but it's like everywhere, like earthquakes. I used to live somewhere here in the middle of this place. So I moved away because if there's an earthquake, it's going to be very badly hit there. Um, uh, plasma physics, you know, of course, air, you know, air wing design, but also things like uh, the, the, um, the electronic structures of the Schrodinger equation. Now, um, what, the, what is the sort of the idea of using deep learning uh, to solve PDEs is basically not necessarily to solve them more accurately, but to so solve them orders of magnitude faster. And uh, the reason that's useful, for instance, if you want to go through fast design cycles, right? If you want to design the new tokamak, um, you, you want to come up with a particular ge geometry, then you, you want to solve the PDE, the, the plasma equations inside them. Um, and then you want to say, okay, uh, maybe now change the design and solve them again. So if, if solving the plasma equations takes takes weeks, the, the design cycle goes very slow. But also, for, you know, predicting uh, storms, let's say. So this is great work by NVIDIA. It's called a forecast. Um, and they, they take a global model uh, of the weather. And uh, so the nice thing about the weather is that the future is always there. So you can check how well you did. Um, and so here's the sort of in, in two of these insets, they just predicted, let's say, the storms, and they found that the ground truth and their predictions using their PDE model um, coincided pretty well. And this is our own work I will talk a little bit more about, which is called Clifford Neural Layers, uh, which is a, um, you know, a, a new way to sort of handle vectors um, in these PDEs. Okay, so what is a PDE? Um, a PDE can basically always be written as a first-time derivative of some some vector field U. So th this could be, you know, a bunch of scalars, a bunch of vectors, you know, a bunch of basically along an array of fields, which depends on X and T. And then we write on the left-hand side, the first order derivative is some nonlinear function or linear function, whatever, of time, space, the fields, and all the possible spatial derivative of these fields, right? And typically we don't go to two high order um, derivatives, but the general formulation is like this. And if there would be a second order time derivative here, you could then transform this thing by defining new fields so that it becomes first order again. Now, there's also an initial, initial condition. For instance, for the weather, you can get this initial condition from lots of observations in the atmosphere, um, and then basically turning that into a, a starting point for your Navier-Stokes equation to, uh, to integrate forward. Um, and there's boundary conditions typically, um, for instance, the, you know, the interaction with the ocean or something like that, or the Earth or something. Um, so the, the question, you know, use machine learning to solve these PDEs faster. Um, so what we're just going to think is as a PDE solver, as an iterative program, um, and we're going to write it as a differentiable iterative program, because once we do that, basically, at home, we can do back propagation through the system, and we can just optimize it based on data. And data, in this case, could be real data, but it could also be typically actually uh, data generated from numeric simulations. Um, these are typically expensive, but the idea is that we now don't throw them away anymore. We're going to recycle all of the all of these simulations that we're doing. We are going to recycle them and then store that information in a neural network that can then uh, sort of predict the answer of the numerical solver faster next time if it is in a regime where it's trained well. Of course, if it gets into a completely new regime, it should understand that it should go back to the numerical solver again. Um, now, 
PDEs is a is a pretty intimidating field. It's it's under it, it exists for hundreds of years. Many books have been written on it. Many very very smart people have worked on it. And so it's not like we're going to change this field overnight. Um, there's many requirements. Uh, you know, we want accuracy. We want stability over long rollout. We want speed. We want computational cost to be low. It needs to be easy to use. We need uncertainty quantification. We need generalization. This is actually very important. If certainly for our PDEs, you know, if we change the initial conditions, this the solver shouldn't fall apart. Similar for boundary conditions. Maybe we want to change the parameters of the PDE a little bit. Maybe the grid resolution or the regularity needs to be changed a bit. The geometry, the topology, the dimensionality. There's so many dimensions, right? And we sort of want to generalize across all of these dimensions. Um, so I'll just give you a little bit of an overview of what's been going on in this field. Um, very, very biased and very, very short. Um, but just give you a, a flavor of the things that, are, that have happened. So the first paper that got me introduced to this field is only from 2019. It's uh, from, from uh, Patrick Hoyer's lab. And this I would classify as a, as a somewhat sort of hybrid method. So the method really tries to stay close to the numerical PDE solver. Um, but it, it sort of argues that there are certain things in there which can be parameterized and can be learned by backpropagation. For instance, um, if you want to compute a partial derivative of a field, um, this is typically computed through what's called a stencils. It's basically finite differences with alphas, some, some set of numbers there. And basically they said, let's, let's train these alphas and see if we can improve uh, integration. And what they found is that, for instance, in these kind of, so this is a sort of a solution of a Burgers equation. And what they found is that when it's close to these shock waves, different stencils for the same derivative were optimal than if you would sort of be here instead of another regime. And so it's sort of an adaptive way to compute a numerical derivative. Very cool work. Um, so another really big, you know, hype and, and not just hype, it's, it's, it's a great idea. Um, it's called these physics informed neural networks. Um, so this you can think of as an implicit neural network where you stick in a position X and time T. So these are now three, four numbers, if you wish, right? Um, not voxelized or gridded. So you stick these numbers in, you push them through a neural network to directly predict your field U at that position X and T. And of course, now you can put anything in here if you have your neural network. So the gen, you know, in, in, in principle, you can compute the fields everywhere now. Then you backpropagate to get the partial derivatives that you need. Then you have a, uh, basically at a bunch of points, you can compute, let's say, uh, the, the PDE, so the value of the PDE, um, uh, sort of uh, itself, so d dt u minus f of x and dx, et cetera, you can compute that and compare it with the actual PDE. Um, and then you just want to minimize that error. Um, and so uh, you can also give it other errors like boundary conditions and initial conditions and stuff like that. And then you sort of minimize this whole thing. Um, it doesn't require any sort of supervised data, so you don't have to give it numerical solver data. You can, in principle, just by you know, into, you know, propagating the initial and the boundary conditions to the inside, you can basically solve the, all, all the constraints that are formed by the PDE itself. It typically is quite hard to learn. Uh, it's good for high dimensional problems. Uh, for low dimensional problems, uh, grid, grid methods are typically better. And then there is this whole field called uh, sort of uh, operator uh, learning. Uh, there's two famous examples, but uh, many more. There's the deep O net. Um, and it's the neural Fourier operator um, at work. Um, basically, what happens here is that you basically map a particular gridded solution, um, or well, actually, maybe not gridded. So it's 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 defined in terms of operator. So they want to get rid of the actual. They want to be grid independent. But you sort of map a function um, on, let's say, on one time instant to a function on the next time instant, and then you learn that function, which is basically the operator, which maps one time slice to the next time slice, let's say. And again, you can formulate this as a neural net. Um, so the Fourier neural operator work, you know, first does Fourier transformations, and then does operations on the Fourier transformation, then transforms back, uh, gives you sort of, sort of global information over the whole thing. Uh, both of them work great. Um, and and, um, and uh, yeah, so if they sort of, sort of form one part of one field. Um, 
So I've been working uh, with Rianna uh, van der Berg, and uh, we have been uh, sort of supervising uh, these two people, although I should say they are super independent, and most of what you will be seeing is just their work. Um, uh, Jayesh Gupta and uh, Johannes Brandstedt at Microsoft, they are fantastic researchers, fantastically smart people, and they, they came up with this idea of this sort of Clifford layers. Now, it's, it's based on, um, on this idea that, um, again, in, we tend to think or we, we learn in school um, that there are scalars and vectors, basically, and then maybe matrices. Um, and so that's the things that are in our mind if, when we sort of do vector calculus. But it turns out um, that there are other objects uh, called bivectors and trivectors, which are basically uh, sort of surface elements. Um, it's sort of the outer product of like a vector in, in one direction and a vector in another direction. And sort of the outer product sort of becomes a, sort of a, a, a is represented by three numbers. That is, it represents a vector that's ortho, orthogonal uh, to this surface. Um, we tend to think of this, let's say, as classification, the, the, the W in a sort of in a, in a support vector machine has this property. Um, and of course, if you flip X and Y, then actually it flips. So there's, it's a signed vector that, that if, you, if you mirror the world, it will actually also uh, flip sign. Um, and then there is actually also tri vectors, which are, which are volume elements, um, et cetera. So, so we typically don't think about these, but the, they are geometric objects. Um, and they, you can all of them organize them in this, what's I think is called a multi-vector. Uh, so one is a scalar. These are the three sort of uh, uh, unit vectors in three directions for the vectors. And then you have sort of these, these combinations of these unit vectors, uh, which form bivectors and trivectors. Now, um, in this particular small little uh, GIF that was created by uh, Jayesh and, and, and Johannes, um, you can sort of see a little bit, you know, what I mean when you do multiplications in this space. Um, so basically, uh, you know, there is these, these vector and these, these, uh, these bivector and trivector components. Um, and you can sort of multiply two vectors together. And it's, so you're used to, do, to then get sort of a number like the inner product or maybe a vector, which is the outer product. But it turns out um, you could you know, multiply to multi vectors and you'll get out another multi vector. And, and the rules are written out here. They're very complicated, but they're written out. And then, of course, the, 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 they, they, are, they again form you know, the vectors and multi vectors, et cetera. Now, the trick is now, and the, the trick that they came up with is the idea to then basically say, well, we know how to do a convolution. And in convolution, we use numbers, we use scalars. Now, let's replace uh, the scalars by vectors and or multi-vectors in principle. Now, that's what you need in PDEs, because in PDEs, you have these vector fields, right? Yeah, you might have an electric field and a magnetic field. An electric field is a vector. A magnetic field is a sort of a, a bivector. They behave precisely that way. And so you, you want to represent them as vectors. And so you can do this very beautifully in this Clifford convolution. And it's literally the same equation as you would use for a convolution, except for now, all the things that are written here as, as numbers, as scalars, you now replace them by bolded, bolded objects, which are these multivectors. And you use the rules of multivector multiplication in order when you process these things when they get multiplied. That's really all there is to it. There's also a very nice trick for doing Fourier transformations, which actually was their initial um, motivation to go into this. And so what you can now do is to apply this to PDEs on vector valued quantities. Um, so here is, a, for instance, um, you know, a scalar field, which is a pressure field. And then here's a vector field. It's a little small to see, but there's a vector field, which is the wind velocity. And they interact with each other. So pressure differences generate wind. And wind, and wind then generates, again, pressure differences. And so you can very beautifully process that with these multi-vector convolutions and Fourier transformations. Um, and here is an electromagnetic set of equations where, the, where again, you have vectors and bivectors that you can very naturally process. And what they found, basically, is that if they take an FNO layer, which is a Fourier neural operator learning, uh, Fourier neural operator, and they replace it by a Clifford Fourier neural operator, keeping the number of parameters the same, you see that you can get a huge boost. And the, and the more you get coupling between vectors and bivectors, like in the electromagnetic case, the bigger the boost in performances.
Um, so I want to add one more thing for the PDE modeling, uh, which I thought was very nice. And I also feel there is a huge amount of things that still can be done here. And I would encourage uh, the sort of smart mathematicians in, in the room here to think about this a little bit. Um, so, you know, coming from equivariance, we were thinking, okay, uh, you know, actually PDE equations, equations satisfy a certain symmetry transformation. So for instance, here's a PDE equation, it's the court de vries equation. Um, and there are certain operations you can apply to space and time, for instance, here, uh, you know, shift time a bit, you know, translate uh, space a bit, um, you know, translate both X and the field variable. And here's a really weird one, a uh, very nonlinear one. Um, but if you do these, it's guaranteed that the solution is mapped into another solution. Of course, you know, you also need to transform the initial and boundary conditions. And that's really great. And we thought, okay, so now we're going to make an aggravated neural network. But um, it was much harder than we thought, even though there is actually code to get you all the symmetry transformations of a PDE, so you can list them. Um, but then turning that into an equivariant architecture, um, we didn't quite succeed, uh, but I think it can be done. And I think people will do it at some point in time. Um, and so I, I'll, I'll just encourage you here to do it. Um, what we basically did was uh, we said, okay, well, this could be used for data augmentation. We can just, out of one solution, we can generate a whole bunch of more solutions basically for free. We can add them to our data stack and then train on those as well. It's kind of it's kind of expensive to actually generate data with numerical solvers, so this is a very cheap way to gen to to increase your data set using augmentation, and that works quite well. Okay, so now I'll switch gears a little bit um, in the second half of my talk, uh, and and actually talk about what I promised about um, at the risk of repeating myself a little bit relative to last time. I forgot precisely what I talked about, um, but there's some new stuff I promise. So um, I believe that molecules represent a huge opportunity. Um, and the reason I find is that uh, materials have always been at the core of humanity in some sense, right? We, are, we almost define ourselves by the materials that we, we define the era in which we live um, by the materials that we use, like right? Stone Age, Bronze Age, Iron Age, or I guess you you it in the Plastic Age or something like this. And what you know, we have started to imagine is what would happen if one day um, we could basically um, conjure up materials on demand. So you tell me, I need a material with these and these properties, right? It needs to be strong, to be transparent. It needs to degrade when I throw it into the mud uh, within one week, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, then you basically go through a search engine, you type in these things that you want, the search engine searches through 10 to the 180 possible materials, finds you 10 of those, right? It tells you the properties of those. You say, I want that one, right? And you send it off on your phone and it gets produced and basically you have your material. Right? In the future, this happened, right? And in fact, it would completely revolutionize the way we live, right? Because we could now not just build sustainability, we could find, you know, catalysts, we would make it much cheaper to split water into hydrogen and oxygen or produce fertilizers or produce new uh, photo cells, right? Um, or we could find a new genetic organic framework or whatever material that would pull out carbon out of the air super efficiency and release it at a slightly higher temperature. We could, we could do these things by basically building the search engine. Um, and I think we are at the point where we can really make strong progress on this, uh, on the, the dream. Um, um, because the, the, the science have matured really far and the modeling technology is really a point in the S curve, right? In the, in the, in the, in the hockey stick curve where we really see very strong acceleration, both in computational science, machine, of course, particular deep learning, and then in the future, hopefully also in, in, in quantum computing. But the thing I want to emphasize most and stress most, in fact, um, the application, the societal applications of this are really huge. And I think we'll see very strong pull on these applications and therefore on this particular computational science problem. In health, we want new antibiotics, which, are, you know, which work actually against, anti, uh, against resistant uh, bacteria or new uh, vaccines or new drugs against cancer or all the kinds of things. 
we want to make sure that the energy transition happens super important now that we have a war um, in East Europe um, and we don't get any gas anymore, right? We want to not become dependent anyway. We don't want to be dependent anymore on gas and oil, and we can use this to accelerate the energy transition that we really have to make together to wind and others and, and, and solar and other sustainable um, energy sources. And then uh, finally, of course, sustainability. We need to be, we need to start pulling carbon out of the air, otherwise we are going for disaster. Um, and also, my hope is that new materials can also help with that. Um, so here's sort of this idea uh, of a search engine for molecules, which I which I talked about. So that there is, let's say, a molecule, sort of particular molecule. You can sort of compute its properties using the traditional quantum. Chem chemistry or other chemistry methods like molecular dynamics. It's slow, but you can do it. There's a neural surrogate model, um, which could uh, sort of sort of shortcut these camp these calculations, but you can train it. But the real uh, holy grail, in my opinion, is the inverse design problem, which is you just give me the properties, and I will just generate for you the molecules, you know, with these uh, sort of with these properties, right? In, and, and I would imagine it's a, it's a mixture of these, you know, you first generate using a generative model, lots of candidates, and then you sift through these using these forward models, uh, and hopefully uh, these fast forward models to so very quickly, you know, select down on, on the most promising candidates. Um, and so, uh, yeah, just, I think I, I, I talked about this last time, um, I, I won't go into details, it's basically the idea that these, um, diffusion-based generative models, which are so successful um, in language, in image generation, like, you know, we have seen this tremendous progress on just giving a prompt and then having a video of something that that, that, that visualizes what's in the prompt. I mean, I, I my eyeballs pop out every time I see something like that, and I'm wonderfully amazed at all this progress that we're making. But one question I want to ask myself, should we really generate teddy bears on the street, or should we generate molecules uh, that can actually be new drugs, right? And I really think we should throw our money at the latter problem, and that's what we're trying to do with AF science. And um, sort of, of course, we make everything equivariant. It's the, the beauty is that here the equations, the symmetries are actually perfectly satisfied, but we all know that, you know, the orientation at which we process a molecule really shouldn't matter. So all of these graph neural networks that I described should really be equivariant. We can generative diffusion model also beautifully equivariant. And so here then is a sort of the sort of a, a illustration of the model built by these good people again, Emil Hochblom, Victor Pratikas, and Clement uh, Vignac. Um, so what you see here is uh, basically an, uh, sort of denoising of a bunch of uh, noisy atoms of different types, and you generate basically a stable thermodynamically stable molecule out of it. Every time it's a different one, and it doesn't care about the orientation in which it was generated. Um, so here you can see sort of a selection of molecules. You can you can test them for stability, and, and they are typically stable. Now, as I said, I, but I think the holy grail is really something else. The holy grail is not just generate from the equilibrium distribution, from the Boltzmann distribution. What we really want is conditional equilibrium generation, which means you just tell me what you want. Right? It needs to bind to this disease, it needs to be non-toxic, it needs to be easy to synthesize and all these kind of good things. And then it will have to generate molecules with those properties. <clears throat> that's much harder. I think you should work on that. So that's my, my view. So we tried it here a little bit, um, you know, increasing the polarization. It did something, but not satisfactory. And so I worked with a bunch of other people, EPFL, I'll show the faces of uh, these smart people uh, next. Uh, we worked on these two problems. Um, the first problem is uh, molecular linker design, which is, okay, I have a protein, uh, which is a pocket, and I want to sort of design a ligand which sort of nicely fits into that pocket so that it sort of controls its, uh, its activity or something like that, so a, a drug. And so typically, what people know is they, ha they have pieces, uh, anchors, or, 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 or basically um, small pieces of a molecule, uh, that, that they know and they can sort of place the, the positions. But what they need is they need to fill in the gaps, basically. So they need to fill in the gaps of this of this molecule. They need to link together these pieces, these, these functions, 
Um, and they need to do it in such a way that it all fits nicely into the book. Um, and so here's the, the people that uh, we worked with uh, from Bruno Breira's lab. Um, also, Mark Bronstein was involved, a whole bunch of other people too. But the faces here are, the, the, of course, the people who do the real work, the sweating. Um, but I should also say uh, much of the thinking. Um, so, OK, so what do we want to do? Um, so we want to basically say, uh, so this is the first simple step of a conditional model. We say, OK, here's a pocket. These green atoms are a pocket. Um, and then we're going to generate a bunch of atoms and sort of noisily, randomly in the middle. And then we're going to do fusion or, or denoising, sort of anti-diffusion, if you wish, to turn them into a nice ligand, a nice molecule which fits into that pocket that we uh, want to achieve. And we want to do it with uh, with these kind of fragments. So we start with these fragments and we want to sort of, we, we, we put them at, at, at a fixed position. We want to sort of fill in the details. Uh, before this work, uh, people have worked on fragments, uh, but always two. So here we work with a variable number of fragments, variable linker size, unknown anchors, which means where do they connect, and no clashes with the, with the protein pocket. And uh, we, we used uh, something that worked. Basically, uh, we, we just said, well, that's not try to be too complicated. We used the uh, diffusion model that was already developed, and I showed the results before. But now with this pocket fixed, um, and you can see maybe here, so the, 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 the pipeline is you start with the fragments, they are fixed. Then you go through a neural network, and then you figure out, OK, how many atoms do I need to link them together? That's from a distribution. And then you go to some anti-diffusion to make sure that it actually uh, links these things together. Um, and then here's another sort of animation of how that works. Um, here's a little video of how that sort of works. Um, and here's a bunch of examples. And for the experts in the room, they can inspect them and say, well, that's a ridiculous molecule, or that's a very nice molecule, or something like that. Of course, I don't know nothing about that, but I've been told the whole thing works pretty reasonable. And then the last topic I want to talk about in the last sort of five minutes um, is the control part. So, you know, how do you control molecules or why do you even want to control uh, molecules? This is for this group of people, um, which also involved chemists. So it's very enjoyable to work with domain experts. Um, I, I, I like to think of this as Project Sisyphus because um, Sisyphus was this poor guy who needed to roll a stone up the hill. And then by the time he was up, it, it rolled down again and he had to do this forever. Um, so that's sort of like trying to simulate a molecule as it as it goes over a sort of energy barrier. If you just do this by natural molecular dynamics, this thing will fluctuate a little bit up the barrier, but invariably it will come back and it will take the age of the universe to actually get to the other side. So that's not what you want. So what fit, what the chemists do is they basically push it. So they they actually they apply forces. Um, so that it actually moves over and then they correct for it and then they can study basically the molecule at the various stages of this process. Um, they have a process which uh, which basically first computed the reaction coordinates is one of two uh, you know properties, let's say distances between two parts of the molecule or angles or something like that. And then they track these 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 angles or these distances um, and and then they try to do their sampling that way. Now, what we did is we said, well, what if we don't know? you know, what this reaction coordinate is. So what we really want is to sort of push the entire, sort of push every um, atom in this process. We just add new forces, control forces, 